writing about myself is most difficult. Never before I expected that one day walking past gold and valuable gems, they will have so little meaning to me. Now, as I write these words, right safely back on earth, I'm trying to figure out why. They were nobody's property at the time, the inmates were saying to themselves. Perhaps I almost agreed with their explanation at the time. But first and foremost, I could not get rid of my aversion to things that I had seen as stained with blood. Besides, even if I forced myself, there was really no point in doing that. In some bizarre way, those things had long lost their value for me. Even more, at the time I was going through a period maybe due to having experienced so much or maybe due to my faith's demands, for I have always been a man of faith, of valuing my own contentment much higher than some stone. If I would force myself to take gold or diamonds, it would have felt as if I plunged from those heights I climbed with so much effort. The first and major obstacle to looking for gold was the tangible conviction that by doing so, I would hurt myself in some way. This is what I was feeling then, and who knows? Maybe, if I were to face a similar situation now, I would do the same thing again. My fellow inmates had various attitudes towards that. To me, money was of no use at the time. But when, much later, I wanted to leave the camp, and it would have been handy to have some, I asked one prisoner, his name was Romek, identity unknown, to escape with me, and asked if he had any money, just in case. He said that he would tell me the next day, for he had to count it. The next day he told me that he had over a kilogram of gold. But it just so happened that I did not leave the camp with him, but with colleagues who did not have a single penny on them. But that is a thing of the future. For now, I had no intention of leaving the camp, still waiting for the most interesting moment in the camp at which all work was aimed. For a couple of months now, we could have taken over the camp almost every day. We were waiting for the order, though, understanding that even though it would surely be a spectacular and unexpected firework for Poland and the rest of the world, we could not let ourselves be guided by nothing but our own ambition, just because Mr. X or Mr. Y had accomplished something like that before. Such risk must not be taken without orders. We were itching to do something, but with great difficulties we held ourselves back. We understood very well that to act without orders would simply confirm our centuries-old national flaws, an explosion of ambition, private desires that could potentially lead to a tragic aftermath in the whole of Silesia. At that time, it was still difficult to foresee the potential curse of action. We were still hoping to be able to play the role that was assigned to us, coordinated with the rest of the operation. This was the concept behind all of our reports, addressed directly to the commander-in-chief himself. Out of caution, fearing that someone out there might make a false move, we wanted to avoid any middlemen when delivering our reports. We were not sure how deeply the German intelligence had infiltrated the higher levels of our organization, perhaps, they had even reached those in charge of the entire Polish underground. There was always possibility that they realized what was afoot. They would surely have had the most resourceful individuals here blown to pieces. It was then when we overheard about the pacification of the Lublin region. First, among the things to be burned, among the worse and somewhat ruined shoes, one day peasants' shoes, large and small, and later on Polish peasants' clothing, prayer books in Polish, and simple rosaries were found. A murmur was heard among our fives. People began to form groups, 
One could see cold determination in their eyes, fists clenched impatiently. Those were the belongings of our Polish families, exterminated in the gas chambers of Birkenau, following the pacification of the Lublin region, as we were told by our colleagues from Rajsko. The populations of several Polish villages were brought here to be gassed. This is how things are in the world, and there is not much we can do about it. Whenever items belonging to people were brought from abroad, shoes, suitcases, and were burnt in tannery, for many months they have been for us like a horrific echo of the murders which happened. Dealing with that for us was always monstrous experience. But now, when we saw a tiny shoe, a woman's blouse, and among all of that rosary, our hearts were beating faster with desire of revenge. Young boys, aged 10 to 14 or 15, were picked from these transports from Lublin. They were separated from the rest and released into the camp. We thought that they were going to survive somehow. One day, when news about some incoming inspection has reached the camp, in order to avoid explaining the presence of prisoners so young and maybe for some other reason as well. The camp authorities had them all murdered with fennel injections in Block 20. We saw a great number of heaps of corpses in the camp, but this particular pile of young bodies, about 200 of them, affected everyone, ever long-serving prisoners like us making our hearts race. Several new members joined our organization in the tannery. 151, 152, 153, 154, 155, all identity unknown. At the same time we created our organization a new planning and advisory unit. Colonels 24, Karol Komuniecki, 122, Teofil Jama and 156, Stanisław Wierzbicki, have joined. Being in Auschwitz, I often witnessed one or another colleague receiving a letter from home in which his mother, father or wife would beg him to sign the Volksliste. It was usually the case with prisoners with German-sounding surnames or who had a mother whose maiden name had been German or who had some German relatives, and so on. Later on, the authorities made the whole process easier. They did not require any German-sounding surnames anymore, nothing but a will to erase a Polish conscience, unless there were the higher reasons. How often hearty lads who were seen in this hell were not bothered by their foreign-sounding names and did not see it as an obstacle of being worthy of calling themselves Poles. They would say with fondness, yes, I love my mother, wife, or father, but sign the list, I will not. I will perish here, that much I know. The wife is writing, my beloved Yash, sign it. No, hell no. Nobody will ever spit on my Polish identity. I might be young, but unbreakable. Oh, how many such men died in Auschwitz and had a most fine death, having stood their ground on the redoubt of the Polish conscience to the end. Would all countrymen who bear a Polish name and freedom fight for their Polishness? A apparatus of a sort capable of inspecting one's Polish conscience would be of great help. From the beginning of the war through that time, the conscience of different people took the different directions. In the second half of October, my colleague, it was 41, Stanisław Stawiszyński, who had informed me about it, noticed that two of the worst infamous capos, not only infamous for killing inmates, but also for being informants of the political department and its chief, Grabner, were wandering around the camp as if looking for someone, writing down the numbers of some prisoners. 
One day in the afternoon, when I was rushing down the main road, on my way from block 22 to see my colleagues in the vicinity of the infirmary, I encountered these two capos in front of block 16. One of them was holding a notepad. The second one approached me with this fake smile and asked, Volovst du? just to say anything very clearly, pointing my number to the other one, and then walked away immediately. The other man looked at me, as if in hesitation. Since they both left, I continued on my way, thinking the whole situation to be a mistake of some kind. During the morning roll call on October 28th, 1942, the Schreibers in various blocks started to call out the numbers of prisoners, saying that these inmates had to go to the Erkennungsdienst to have their photos checked. 240-something prisoners were called out together, only Poles, as we later determined. They were mostly from Lublin, with about a quarter of them having nothing to do with the transports from Lublin. All the prisoners were led for a time being to block three, which was suspicious in the first place because the stated reason for calling them out to go to the Erkennungsdienst was in block 26. The bell for Arbeitskommando tolled for us and we then left the camp as usual, each commando to its designated destination to work. While working the Tension in all the commandos was great indeed. We did not know whether those called out were in danger or not. Later, one rumor came from somewhere that they were going to be gunned down. 240 boys, mainly from Lublin, later joined by men who had been picked rather at random by Grabner's lapdogs who were on the lookout for the numbers of those whose vitality and energy were visible. What was steering them? We never found out. Perhaps it was the only the whim of these two thugs. Though it was called the pacification of Lubelstrizna, the Lublin region, which resonated in the camp with enormous strength. Brave 41, Stanislav Stavishinsky from Warsaw, the first one to have reported certain numbers being recorded, was to be found among them. For a time being, we did not know whether they were really going to be shot. We thought it was maybe only a rumor. So many inmates had never been shot at the same time until now. The mask of apparent positivity was turning us as we were ready. We wanted to act. We, at the top of the organization, had been almost biting our nails, getting ready for the showdown just in case. If among those had burst out riots and resistance, all of us would join the action. A rebellion would have united the spirit among our people. That would have been Fizz Mayer and would have allowed us to act. On the way to the camp, our 500 healthy men, indoor workers, were passing the construction office under which was a spare armory. Then, this was not difficult. The boys were afire. Everyone was always ready for death, but before that we would pay back our tormentors bloodily. There was only nine miserable watchtowers and Hauptwache. Only twelve Gemeins were escorting us. They were wearing the rifles slung over their shoulders and taking them in their hands just before the camp out of fear of their superiors because they were accustomed to our calmness. If only by some miracle, one word arrived from Warsaw, proceed today to rescue them. Yes, this was a daydream. Did anyone know? Was anyone thinking about that? From a distance, one could perhaps say that it was just a fragment of Poland's martyrdom. But how hard it was having received a message in the afternoon that all of them, calmly, without problems, were shot. We spoke to each other many times that evening, thinking, how did each of them die? Were they afraid of death? Or did they face it fearlessly? The inmates who were murdered on October 28, 1942, 
knew what it was in store for them. In Block 3, they had been told that they were going to be shot. They were throwing scribbled notes to the inmates, who were still spared, containing their last words that were meant to be passed on to their families. They wanted to die the cheerful way, so that they would be well spoken of that evening. Let no one tell me that we, the Poles, do not know how to do it. Those who had seen this picture said that they were never going to forget it. From block 3, between blocks 14 and 15, between the kitchen and blocks 16, 17 and 18, and then straight between the blocks of the infirmary, they were marching on, grouped in a column of five, with their calm heads held high, some of them smiling. They were walking without an escort. Behind them, Palic with a rifle on his shoulder and Bruno Brodniewicz both were smoking cigarettes and chatting. It was enough that the last five would turn around, that those two executioners would cease to exist. Why did they go then? Were they afraid for themselves? What, what could they possibly have feared already on their path to death? It seemed like a psychosis of some sort, but they were walking because they had their rights. They knew as the authorities announced it long ago, and it was confirmed by the colleagues who were brought to the camp from the outside world, that for every excess of the prisoner, the whole family would be accountable. It was known that the Germans are ruthless when it comes to reprisals, and that they exterminate families showing such brutality which only they were capable of. And how brutality looks, who knows better than us? To see, or just to know, that mother, wife, or children would find themselves in such circumstances as those which the women in Raisko had to endure, that was enough to paralyze all will of revenging the executioners. The entire camp, however, a different story. To take control, to destroy the documents, who would be held responsible? It would be difficult to try to capture tens of thousands of families at once. But even that, after long deliberation, we made dependent on explicit orders because of the possibility of the reprisals that could follow and a desire to coordinate the action. Being used to death, which we have to face several times a day, the thought of our own death was easier than the thought of hurting our loved ones. Not only their death, but those awful experiences which are connected with the beloved ones being taken from the earth by the iron fist, breaking their spirit and pushing them into a different world, world of hell, to which not everyone easily come. Thinking that an old mother or father are walking in a knee-deep mud with the last resource of strength, poking and beating with a rifle butt, as a result of a son's behavior, our children are going to the gas chambers because of their father. It was much harder than thinking of one own's death. And even if there was someone for whom the standards were too high, he walked, led by the other's example. He was ashamed. This word is too weak. He did not dare to break out of the calm walking with grace and courage towards death. So they walked. Near the canteen, a wooden building next to block 21, going down the road between blocks 21 and 27, the column seemed to stop and hesitate for a while, and almost went straight on. But it was just a short moment. They turned left, and 90 degrees towards the gate of block 11 and marched straight into the jaws of death. It was not until after the gate was shut tight behind them and they were left on the block for several hours to be shot in the afternoon. During this waiting for death, the doubts started to emerge. Five colleagues were found who started to encourage others to take over the camp 
up to the moment when the action starts. They barricaded the gate, and this might have even had evolved into something more serious. The Germans did not reinforce the guards at all, and all your commandos were eagerly awaiting for the sign to start action. If not that this protest against death did not spread beyond Block 11. Apart from these five colleagues, the rest did not let themselves to be entailed, and the Silesian, who was an orderly at the block, informed the SS men of this fireband. Palit appeared on the block, assisted by several SS men. Then they dealt with these colleagues, shooting them at first, leaving the rest for after dinner. In our eyes, they gained the opinion that they died in a battle. Captain Dr. 146 Henrik Suchnitsky, colleague 129 Leon Kukielka, and three other colleagues. They were all dead in the afternoon. From our organization, except from those whom I had mentioned before, the following colleagues had fallen on that day. 41 Stanisław Stawiszyński, 88 Tadeusz Dziedzic, 105 Edward Berlin, 108 Stanisław Dobrowolski, 146 Henryk Suchnicki. These are only the ones whom I had known, but it was impossible to know everyone in the underground organization such as ours. Upon returning to the camp, we could smell our colleagues' blood in the air. They tried to have their bodies removed to the crematorium before our arrival. The entire road was blood-stained. Their blood must have been dripping from the wagons carrying their bodies. That day in the evening, the entire camp grimly came to terms with these deaths. Only now have I realized that I had almost been put among them on the list of numbers which were called out on that day. Recalling these two capos scribbling down the numbers, I did not know what to think, whether the one with the notepad wrote down my number or not. I might have not looked dangerous enough, but maybe he put me on his list nonetheless, and Grabner later simply removed those without any cases against them from the list. A new transport of prisoners was brought in from Paviak from Warsaw, and once my former co-workers and colleagues from TAP in Warsaw arrived with it, 2nd Lieutenant 156 Stanisław Wierzbicki, 157 Czesław Sikora, 158 Zygmunt Warzyński. They brought some interesting news for me. 156 Stanisław Wierzbicki told me about how 25 Stefan Bielecki reached Warsaw from Auschwitz, and how he, 156, personally drove him to his post in Minsk, Belarus. 158. Zygmunt Wazinski told me in great detail how the message that I had sent through Sergeant 14 Antoni Wozniak regarding the potentially dangerous excerpts from the parish registers in town Z, Bochnia, made my sister-in-law, Mrs. E.O. Eleonora Ostrowska, to rush to him. My good colleague, 158, got on a train that day and made his way to Z, Bochnia, where he explained the whole thing to 160, Władysław Kutz, the parish priest. The priest, 160, Władysław Kutz, wrote down in pencil in the book next to the entry of the owner of my assumed name and promised to take care of everything. This must have been checked out because the camp's political department never mentioned my case again. Colleague 156, Stanisław Wierzbicki, pointed out to me that Captain 159, Stanisław Machowski, from the high command in Warsaw, was among the new arrivals. He was the second in command of Evo 11. One of our members, 138, identity unknown, had known Captain 159, Stanisław Machowski, personally, having been under his command once, and now being a blockman, had easily taken the captain under his protection. Colleague 156, Stanisław Wierzbicki, 
along with 117 Eugeniusz Zaturski, who was already working there. 76 Bernard Świerczyna took to work. Since then, the two TAP men lived and worked together. From the TAP members whom I knew in Warsaw, the following numbers went through Auschwitz. 1. Władysław Surmacki 2. Władysław Dering 3. Jerzy Wirion 25. Stefan Bielecki 26. Stanisław Maringe 29. Włodzimierz Makaliński 34. Identity Unknown 35. Remigiusz Niewiarowski 36. Stanisław Arzt 37. Identity Unknown 38. Kazimierz Chmielewski, 41. Stanisław Stawiszyński, 48. Stanisław Ozimek, 49. Jan Dangel, 85. Zygmunt Bohdanowski, 108. Stanisław Dobrowolski, 117. Eugeniusz Zaturski, 120. Zygmunt Zakrzewski, 124. Tadeusz Chrościcki. 125, Tadeusz Lucjan Chrościcki, 131, Identity Unknown, 156, Stanisław Wierzbicki, 157, Czesław Sikora, 158, Zygmunt Warzyński. Because 129, Leon Kukiełka got shot and 130, Identity Unknown, died of typhoid, it was impossible to continue digging the tunnel from under block 28. The tunnel was never discovered, and five, Roman Zagner, got arrested during the course of another investigation. In late autumn of 1942, when the block men were sent to work in the fields, clamping potatoes, four, Alfred Stussel, also started working on them quite far away from the camp. A disoriented SS man from the political department, Lachmann, Gerhard Lachmann, came to see four in some case, but he was absent at the moment. Lachmann turned around and left. His colleagues quickly realized what was going on, rushed into four's room as the block man of block 28. He had a separate room and had cleared it of any items that would potentially complicate things. Someone must have split the beans. Lachman had only reached the gate and, as if struck by something, turned back and searched for his room very throughoutly, but he did not find anything. He was waiting for four when he was coming back from work in the evening and had him arrested and took him to the bunker. Four never came back to block 28. He was interrogated at block 11 in the bunker and in political department. Even though Four used to have a rather nasty mania those last days, I must admit that he took the torture investigation with courage and said nothing, even though he knew a great deal. They lost track here. Fortunate for him, he caught typhoid and was moved to the typhoid block. One needs to go through a certain gradation of understanding that, just like the world outside, behind the bars was freedom for prisoners in the camp. For those who had been locked in the bunker, the camp itself was freedom. Getting out of the bunker, even if one was ill, to the typhoid block was a substitute of freedom for him. But even here, he had been under the constant watch of the SS man. Lachmann was not about to concede defeat, for Alfred Stussel had a strong character and strong will though. One night he just stopped living. The colleagues who had been brought here from Warsaw and whom I have already mentioned, 156 Stanisław Wierzbicki, 157 Czesław Sikora, 158 Zygmunt Warzyński, said that they did not expect to see such strong spirits and relatively good physical condition among the prisoners here in Auschwitz. They said that they knew nothing about the torture methods here, about the wailing wall, about the fennel, about the gas chambers. They themselves did not think, nor anyone in Warsaw thinks about Auschwitz seriously as an outpost of any considerable strength. 
The word about town in Warsaw was that there was not much worth saving here, mostly skeletons hardly worth liberating. It was a bitter thing to hear people saying that while looking at the brave silhouettes of my colleagues. So, people of great worth were dying here just to keep someone out there safe. And they, people much weaker, were speaking about it with disregard and calling us skeletons. It took a great deal of self-sacrifice to keep dying for our brothers, merrily enjoying themselves while free. Yes, all the methods of destruction used here had a devastating effect upon us. And on top of that, to add such insult to injury, such assessment from the freedom and this continuous indifference, this indifferent silence. The four battalions had their service roasted, divided, so that each battalion was on duty for one week. This means that it was this battalion's job to act in the case of some airstrike or a weapons drop. All the goods procured by 76, Bernard Świerczyna, 77, Zbigniew Ruszczyński, 90, identity unknown, 94, identity unknown, and 117, Eugeniusz Zaturski, were sent to the battalion on duty as well. It was also this battalion's duty to distribute food and underwear among the core platoons that week. Despite it not being exactly a ban, because it meant nothing to a prisoner, on black marketeering, in gold and diamonds in the camp, trade in those items flourished and those caught were subject to capital punishment. An entire quasi-organization was founded because each pair of prisoners who ever had any dealings with each other, food barter, for example sausages from the butchery for gold, could very well lead to mutually assured destruction. Those caught with gold and beaten in the bunker could expose one another. We were seeing more and more people getting arrested for possessing gold. The SS men were hunting down this new organization with zeal because it was providing them with income. For us, the gold organization had become an excellent lightning conductor protecting us from detection. Any investigation initially on track leading to us was sooner or later bound to lead to the gold organization anyway, and then get convoluted and confusing. The SS men, content with the new source of income, were very reluctant to put any effort into other chores. I have already written down that we kept a close eye on Tsugangs, because it was impossible to know how a colleague coming from freedom would behave in the camp. But even the old prisoners could sometimes act in a surprising manner. Because of one of our colleagues' recklessness, 161 Boleslav Kuchbara, a typical schizophrenic who had been told too much, painted two honorary order of the garter diplomas for the underground work for Colonel 121 Julius Gilevich and colleague 59 Henrik Bartosiewicz. He only spared me due to that colleague's intervention. With these diplomas tucked under his arm, he marched right across the camp's main square at lunchtime to display his handiwork in the infirmary. He could have been easily stopped by an SS man or a capo and asked about them, and that would put those colleagues or maybe even more people at great risk. He showed them to Dr. Two, Władysław Derling, telling him that only I was smart, etc., and that is why he did not prepare a diploma for me. Dr. Two, assisted by Dr. 102, Rudolf Diem, managed to take those diplomas away and destroy them. 161, Boleslav Kutbara, however, was clever. One evening, I got called out by my colleague 61, Konstanty Piekarski, from Block 22, who led me to an SS man. It turned out that this SS man was no other than 161, disguised in a uniform and a coat of an SS man. 
He put them to good use in an escape that occurred shortly after that. The third Christmas in Auschwitz was upon us. I was living in Block 22A at the time, together with the entire Bekleidungswerkstätte Kommando. The Christmas was very different from the previous ones. The prisoners, as always, received their clothes parcels with jumpers from home. This time the authorities finally allowed food to be sent as well. Because of Canada, hunger was no longer an issue in the camp, and the food parcels improved the situation even more. The news about the German troops suffering major defeats improved our morale and the mood of the prisoners considerably. In these improved spirits, the news about the escape, December 30th, 1942, of Mietek, Mieczysław Januszewski, Arbeitsdienst Otto, Otto Kussel, Arbeitsdienst 161, Bolesław Kurbara, and their fourth companion was received with joy. And audaciously prepared escape, made easier by the fact that the Eibeitsdienst could move freely between the small and the great chain of guards, with 161 disguising himself as an SS man, with the insolent act of driving out of the camp in a horse-drawn carriage in broad daylight with a fake pass that the fake SS man flashed at the guard from a distance. It had a added bonus for all the prisoners, thanks to a letter that Otto left in the camp. Bruno Brodniewicz, the camp's senior, Bruno, prisoner number one, the infamous torturer, was locked up by the authorities in the bunker on New Year's Eve. Otto, Bruno's enemy, wrote a letter which he had left on purpose in his coat, left behind in the carriage that they abandoned over a dozen kilometers from the camp. In that letter, Otto said how sorry he was for not having enough time to take Bruno with them despite their previous agreement, and this gold that Bruno still had, well, he could actually keep it. The authorities, hardly known for their quick wittedness, locked Bruno, our torturer, in the bunker for three months. He had it better than any of the camp's inmates in the bunker, but the camp was freed from that thug forever, upon release. He was not restrained to his previous position, but sent to Birkenau on a similar assignment. In the meantime, the whole camp was drunk with joy during Christmas, feasting on food that had been sent to our families and telling the latest jokes about Bruno. Boxing matches and artistic evenings were held in the blocks. Improvised bands and orchestras were walking from one block to another. The general mood was so upbeat in the camp that the old prisoners would nod their heads, saying, Well, well, there was the lager of Auschwitz, but it's gone now. The very last syllable remains Witz. Yes, indeed, the hardship in the camp was weaker from month to month. However, that time we could witness very disturbing scenes. On our way from the tannery with 500 other people, not long after New Year's Day, I witnessed a group of several women and men standing in front of the crematorium, the old crematorium fueled by coal built right next to the camp. There were several of them altogether, young and old, both sexes. They were waiting in front of the crematorium, standing like cattle in front of a slaughterhouse. They knew what they had come for. Among them there was a boy, maybe ten years old, looking for someone with his eyes among the hundreds of people passing by, maybe his father, maybe his brother. Approaching this group, a man would fear seeing contempt in eyes of the woman and children. Here we are, five hundred strong and healthy men, and those several ones will be led to their death. Inside one was shrinking and twisting. But no, walking by with the relief it was notices that in their eyes only contempt was visible. Contempt for death. When entering the gate we saw another group, standing against the wall with their hands raised and their backs turned to the passing rows of returning prisoners. They were going to be interrogated before death. 
they were going to be sent to their oldest at block 11 before Palutz, the executioner, mercifully would end their torment by shooting them in the back of the head. After that, their bloodied corpses would be loaded onto the wagons and carried to the crematorium. Just as we were at the gates, this first group had already been rushed into the crematorium. Sometimes the oppressors did not want to waste a gas container for just a bunch of individuals. They were stunned by blows with rifle butts and half-conscious pushed onto the blazing ovens. From our block 22, the one standing in the closest proximity to the crematorium, we heard horrifying screams and groans, somewhat muffled or tortured victims being murdered on numerous occasions. Not everyone took the same road back from work to the camp as we did. Those who did not see the faces of the victims, those who took another road were never free from the thoughts, maybe my mother, maybe my wife, maybe my daughter. But those in camp had hearts of stone. Half an hour later, some of them were buying margarine or tobacco, not even noticing the giant mound of naked corpses right next to them, done with the fennel injections. Sometimes someone would tread on the stiff leg of a dead man. On occasion, such a man might have exclaimed, Hey, look, it's Stasho. Oh, well, his turn was today. Maybe it will be mine next week. And yet, this little boy's eyes looking at us, clearly looking for someone, kept me awake for many nights. Unfortunately, the festive mood in the camp and the relaxation it brought upon the inmates had a darker scenario in store for us. Block 27, a warehouse for uniforms and underwear, was where the Bekleidungskammer commando compromised almost exclusively of Poles was working. It was a good commando, working under a roof, giving its workers opportunity to selflessly provide underwear, uniforms, blankets and shoes for their colleagues. They had also the possibility of trading above goods for food with the well-positioned inmates working as blockmen in the slaughterhouse or in food warehouses. The place was good, and with 76 Bernard Schwertrina's help, we managed to provide many of our colleagues with jobs there. The easiness in the camp at the time coupled with the absence of Bruno, who was imprisoned in the bunker at the time, made some of them disregard the necessary means of precaution. The colleagues from Block 27 organized a joint celebration of sharing the Christmas wafer. 76. Bernard Schwertrina recited a patriotic poem of his own authorship. A Silesian woman had two sons, one in the German army, the other one an inmate in Auschwitz. During the prisoner's escape, the other son, standing guard at the outpost, without knowing that this is his brother, shot him. The poem was beautifully written. The mood was pleasant. The result, the authorities decided that the Poles in Block 27 were doing too well, and the political department took it to suggest that the Poles from Block 27 had organized themselves. On January 6th, 1943, the SS men from the political department came to Block 27 during regular working time. They rounded up the entire commando and asked about the identity of the colonel. Colonel 24, Karol Komuniecki, did not say anything, but Lachman approached him and pulled him out to the front. The whole case was already being worked out by the political department. Then, they started to segregate people into three groups. The Reichsdeutsches and the Volksdeutsches were the only group left to continue their labor in the bloc. All the remaining Poles were further divided into two groups, over a dozen intellectuals being put aside to the right, including Colonel 24, Karol Komuniecki, Major 150, Edward Gut-Getinski, Captain 162, Wojimierz Kolinski, 
second lieutenant, 163, Mieczysław Koliński, lawyer, 142, Stefan Niebudek, and those seen as non-intellectuals by the SS men, including Major 85, Sigmund Bogdanowski, pretending to be a gamekeeper, second lieutenant, 156, Stanisław Wierzbicki, and my nephew, a student, 39, Kazimierz Radwański, to the left. They were kept outside in the biting cold for several hours. The intellectuals were then imprisoned in the bunker. The non-intellectuals sent to the so-called Kiesgrube of Palic. The first group was interrogated and tortured in the bunker. The interrogators wanted to obtain confessions regarding the nature of the represented organization. The fate of the other group left to die of hard labor and the biting cold also seemed to have been sealed. Some of the condemned men, however, were able to wrangle themselves out from the commando after several months of hard labor. A couple of colleagues, 117 Eugeniusz Zaturski and 156 Stanisław Wierzbicki, did that too quickly. They worked together in Bekleidungskammer. They lived together in Block 3, in a separate room warehouse. On January 6, 1943, they both successfully managed to avoid being counted among the intellectuals, and by dodging the menace of the bunker, they found themselves in Palic's Kirsgrube for now. My colleague 156, Stanisław Wierzbicki, when asked by me a couple of months earlier, just after his arrival from Warsaw, about the reactions of people in Warsaw to escaping from Auschwitz, replied that the reaction would be twofold. Headquarters gives the Virtuti Militari Award, and society, ignorant of the fact that collective responsibility is no longer the practice, sees it as an act of egoism. Now, having found myself in a difficult situation, he started to persuade me to escape with him. At that moment, I had no such intention. He, a poor soul, did not live long enough to make it. They both made too much fuss about their case. They fell ill, and upon recovering, they found themselves new, less exhausting work. They were not experienced lager men yet. One time, when I thought that they were still in the infirmary, I found out that they both got shot. February 16th, 1943. Lachman caught them in some other commando and asked them where did they come from. They were dead that very day. Soon after, in March, a whole group of intellectuals previously tortured and interrogated in the bunker about the existence of the organization, which was suspected by one of the capos who had witnessed the f unfortunate sharing of the Christmas wafer, was shot. They did not say anything. Honor their memory. Our colleagues from underground work. After throwing the poles out of the Bekleidungskammer, the vacated positions were offered to the Ukrainians. However, the SS men, the commando's chief and the capo did not like them as employees. So slowly, some of the Poles started to find their way back there. Unfortunately, the supplies from the commando were no longer available for us. Other deliveries were working flawlessly, according to Officer Cadet 90s identity unknown calculation. Despite relentless personal searches at the gate, during Christmas period alone, 1942, 700 kilograms of meat products had been smuggled out of the slaughterhouse. In the late fall of 1942, some extraordinary preparations were started in Block 10. All the prisoners and some beds were removed and basket-like wooden screens were installed in the windows outside, preventing anyone from looking inside. Various instruments and implements were delivered. After that, German professors and students started to come in the evenings. They would deliver some people and then stay for a couple of days working on something. In the morning, I chanced upon a professor that left a horrible impression on me. He had a detestable gaze. For quite some time, we did not know anything about the block, and all we could do was speculate. 
They could not manage without the help of the pfleggers from the camp's infirmary. In the beginning, it was just about cleaning. Later on, various other kinds of assistance was called for as well. Two pfleggers were picked to do this, and it just so happened that they both were members of our organization. Our colleagues finally gained access to the permanently locked Block 10. This was of no use to us for some time because they were locked inside. One day, however, one of them, 101, Witold Kostovne, came to me, terribly upset, saying that he could not take it anymore, that what was going on in Block 10 was beyond the limits of his endurance. They did experiments there. Physicians and medical students were conducting experiments in Block 10, having an abundance of human material at their disposal that they could use in any way they wanted, not having to answer for it to anyone. The lives of those guinea pigs were for feet anyway, belonging to the deviants in the camp. One way or another, they were going to die, no matter how or where. They were destined to become ashes. Various uh, sexual experiments were being conducted. Surgical sterilization of women and men. Radiating the genitals of both genders with rays of some kind. Apparently meant to cause infertility. The following tests were showing the results to be positive or negative. There were no sexual intercourses. A commando of men had to provide semen, with which the women were later inseminated with. The tests showed that women who had their reproductive organs exposed to radiation could become pregnant again after several months. Much stronger radiation was applied then, burning their organs. Several dozen women died in horrifying agony. Women of all races were used to those experiments. Polish, German, Jewish, and later gypsy women were brought in from Birkenau. Several dozen young girls were brought from Greece. They all died during these experiments. They all, even if the experiments were successful, were eliminated. Not a single woman, not a single man had ever left Block 10 alive. Attempts were made to create artificial semen, but all the tests failed. In some cases, the artificially created substitute caused infections when injected into women. Women subjected to those tests were ultimately killed with fennel. Colleague 101, Vitold Kostovne, who witnessed all those events, experienced anger that was extremely rare in the long-time inmates. Colleague 57, Edvard Cieszelski, was also a witness to everything that took place in Block 10. They are both alive and free. During our time in Auschwitz, many times we said among ourselves in that little group of ours that if anyone left the place alive, it would surely be a miracle. And it would be difficult to communicate with people who lived normally all the time on Earth. Ordinary human matters would seem too small, too trivial, he would not be understood by them either. But if someone really made it out of here, his duty would be to tell the world about how the real Poles were dying here. He should also say how people were dying in general, being murdered by people. It sounds strange in the language of a Christian, murdered by their brethren, just like centuries ago. This is why I wrote that. We have gone too far, but where exactly? Where are we headed in this progressive of culture?